This podcast contains swear words. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Talking Shit with Tara Cheyenne, a podcast where I interview art makers, art thinkers, art doers about being creative, about being creative while living and eating and paying your rent and shit like that. And although we're all coming from the perspective of professional art makers, the ideas and issues we discuss apply to all of us, trust me. Even if you don't consider yourself an artist, life is a creative act. I am and continue to be your host, Tara Cheyenne Friedenberg, and I am an art maker. I'm a choreographer, I'm a dancer, actor, writer, and educator living on the stolen, unceded territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations here on the west coast of Turtle Island. All right, before we dive into today's interview, I would just like to, as I always do, I know, I know, I know, remind you to please like, to please subscribe, star the hell out of those reviews. It helps folks find our podcast. It's that algorithm type thing. And then there's the real life algorithm where you just like tell somebody about the podcast and say, hey, check this podcast out. It's super interesting. Lots of great ideas. I enjoyed it. You can say that. You can use that as a script if you need to. Um, You know, tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. And if it is within your capacity to donate, it really does help us out a lot. It helps us pay the artists that we interview here. You can go to www.terrashayan.com, upper right-hand corner. Click that Donate button. Super easy to find or we will link you in the show notes. Okay, my guest today is the Adam Grant Warren. Remember that name if you've not heard it before. You're going to want to hear it again. Adam is an art maker of many different genres and mediums, writer, performer, choreographer, filmmaker, currently co-artistic director of Real Wheels Theater here in Vancouver. And early in the episode, you will notice we start talking about the current radio play podcast that has been put out by Real Wheels. And we don't get into talking about the name of that podcast until a little later. So So you know, the name is Disability Tour Bus, and you can go to realwheels.ca and go to their events, Disability Tour Bus, and there's a big old button that says listen now, so I encourage you to check that out. It's up right now. Go check it out. Adam is just a delightful person working on so many things across so many disciplines. I think you're going to really enjoy this podcast. We will link to his bio or put his bio right in those show notes. You can read more about Adam. If you are listening to this before September 14th, 2024, September 14th, you can go to the Dance Center here in Vancouver, Open House, and Adam is going to be sharing some of his research that he's working on right now. And we get into that a little bit in the show notes. I certainly am going to do my best to be there. Oh, Adam, it's so great to connect because we haven't seen each other in ages. A long time. It's been a long time. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it's great to have you on Talking Shit with Tara Cheyenne. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's great to be here. Awesome. Is that what we say? It's great to be here. It's great to be here. <laughs> when was the last time we saw each other? Oh, my gosh. We did like a, a, a movement workshop uh, in, I know it was before pandemic. It's true. Like the before time? Yeah. And then the during time, which I've actually started like losing my ability to remember stuff that happened during the pandemic. Yeah. For me, it just feels like um, perpetually last year or closer. Do you know what I mean? It's really hard for me to to actually think about how many years ago it was. And I think in to a degree, we're still in there, right? But um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, we did a workshop 
with JD. Yeah. And it was, I remember it was in a, somewhere at the top of a whole bunch of stairs. Left of Maine. Left of Maine. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. I wouldn't go up there now. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Um, so let's just like fold right into what's happening with Real Wheels. You are the artistic director. I'm the co-artistic director. You're the co-artistic director with... Sean McDonald and our amazing producer, Jordan Wood. I think we we tend to think of ourselves as, as a kind of a leadership of three. So I can't mention Sean without mentioning Jordan. Awesome. I think of that often. So much of what we do in the arts is we work in ensemble, hey? Yeah. We so lean on each other and uh, it's important. Honestly, it, it does. You know, I hadn't had a lot of engagement with Real Wheels prior to this position. But just, you know, I think Sean and I were like outside a show. I think we went to see Teenage Dick <laughs> at the Arts Club. Yeah. And, um, you know, we just sort of got to talking and he said, we're looking for, you know, uh, maybe are you interested in an associateship? So I started as an associate. And then we kind of realized that I was doing the work of, a, of a, an AD inside my associateship. And he was like, I think maybe this is a co-AD ship. And I'm just like, I think maybe you're right. Uh, yeah. And Jordan was already working with the company at the time. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. I'm such a fan of both of you. It does seem like kind of a match made in heaven. Oh, thanks. It's it's feeling very good. It's feeling very good. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we want, right? It's not like we're making the big bucks, so it better feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to have at least that. Right? Yeah. Totally. And so the project that's happening is it coming out as a podcast or is it coming out as, how are you, how is it framed? It's framed as a radio play podcast. Okay. Like it'll be on podcast platforms, but it is a, like a single piece of audio drama. Right. It's a play essentially, right? It's a play. Yeah. Love it. And I have all the, the rundown of all the folks involved, but can you kind of tell me about how that came to be? Like the story of? Yeah, it's actually a really interesting story, I think, because it's been with the company since long before me. Okay. I think it started in 2019 as a kind of a mobile site specific thing. It's called, I don't think we've said the title, it's called... We haven't yet. It's called Disability Tour Bus. Such a good name. So it was originally scheduled as a sort of mobile site specific thing. It was it was going to take place on a tour. They were going to take Audi. I say they because I wasn't involved at the time. And... Uh, they were going to take people on a tour and the play was going to unfold in the course of a tour. So it was a way to sort of like see around Vancouver and see the sites, but also see, you know, some of these places that are purported to be so accessible that are actually not. And there's a kind of a narrative that runs through that and, and motivates the whole thing. And because of pandemic, um, you know, site specific stuff and close quarter stuff uh, became a bit of a problem. <laughs> And so over the pandemic, uh, I think the project shifted form into an audio play and it, it's shifted form a bunch of times since then. And so this is the result of, you know, a lot of work and a lot of uh, reconceptualization, I think, of, of the piece. And uh, it's ready. Awesome. OK, so we'll make sure to link that so that folks can find it. Great. Disability Tour Bus, and it's written by Amy Amantia and... Yeah, Amy Amanti and Rena Cohen. Fantastic. Yeah, I want to get Amy on the podcast, too. Um, okay, so that's what's happening right now for you. But you're doing a residency at the Dance Center right now. I see. I read. I am, yeah. I'm artist in residence. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about that? It sounds really captivating. Thanks. Um, well, the working title, you know, it's one of those things... Where in the course of the residency, you're like, is this really what this is about? Yeah, uh, I know that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What is it? What am I actually talking about here? Yeah. For now, the the working title is is Good Bully. Okay. And it's actually my first. I would say, you know, my process is normally very much like page to stage type stuff. Okay. And I wanted to do something. This is my first sort of venture as a maker into devisement on the fly sort of devisement. And also it's it's the first kind of meeting of my dance practice and my theater practice, my writing practice. It was time to get in there and start working at things that were less linear, a little more poetic. And, you know, this project seemed like the thing. Um, you know, it's not, I mean, there's there's humor in it. It's based on a sort of a thing, you know, that old saying, you know, tragedy plus time equals comedy. 
the old saw. It's one of my favorites. I use it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think actually one of the first times I heard somebody use it might have been you or somebody talking about you. <laughs> but yeah, tragedy plus time <laughs> equals comedy. So it, it was about this kind of shitty thing that happened to me, or it is about this kind of shitty thing that happened to me when I was in, in I'd say, junior high or a collection of shitty things that like narratively come together like come together as a single thing but it's it it centers around this thing that happened when i was uh, when i was younger mm-hmm. uh, about kind of a, a moment that occurred that in the long run actually taught me how to get myself up and out of my chair and or up you know i'm a, i'm a wheelchair user and you know prior to this thing happening i don't think i was able to get up on my own and get back into a chair if i fall over okay so this weird thing that happened was the thing that taught me how to do that. And it wasn't a great moment. Right. So it's about that. And then it sort of jumps forward uh, to a time where I realized many, many, many years later, just like actually a couple of years into the pandemic, I figured out what happened to the person oh. that, that triggered that moment for me. I didn't figure it out. I learned. Okay. And uh, I guess I can, I mean, I can, I can spoil it a little bit, but the, the unfortunate thing is that Someone told me kind of out of the blue that um, he had passed away. Oh, dear. Yeah, he had passed away. And and it's interesting to me, and it's just continually been interesting. He passed away, and and there's a line in the piece, and it's true. Every time, even now, like many, many 30 years later or whatever, um, every time I fall over, every time I get up, every time I fall over and get myself up and get back on the, on the go, I think of him. Yeah. So the way I got up on that day all that time ago is the way I still do it. So, you know, I guess movement wise, the piece began with a, um, an exploration of the act of choreographically, the act of getting back up. Wow. That's like, that's like gives me chills. It's so potent. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. The things that stay with us and things that also just as you're talking about, the embodiment of tragedy, of trauma, of strength, and just like our synapses of movement, how they they are connected to like memory and emotion and yeah, which is why we dance, of course, <laughs> in many ways, right? You know, I had a really big day just to like make this very much the now, but I had a really big day in the studio yesterday. I was in the studio with, and I, I'm sure you've been in the studio with Sufei Lee. Shout out to Sufei Lee. Oh, yes. Yay. And, you know, Sufe has a beautiful, beautiful ability to put a finger on something very important to a work, leave you to think about the thing that is very important to the work, and just sort of mic drop and get out of the studio. <laughs> oh, you caught it, hey? There are things that Sufe said to me, like, maybe 20 years ago that I still am like, oh, yeah, 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 still, yeah, you know, influenced by. Yeah, it was incredible. So yesterday, yesterday in the studio, I just, I spent a bunch of time in my chair on my back and Sufei was just like, don't hurry. <laughs> Oof. So I sat there and I listened to my own text, a piece of text that I had written to, for the piece. I'm not sure how it fits, but you know, yeah, yeah Sufei just like put my text on a loop and she was like, or they were like, just listen to it. Just listen to it. Just lie there and listen to it and figure out what it does to your body. Oh, and I was just like, yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. And and we're not given permission to take time like that, hey? No. You know, the reason why, and I've been in in residency for, for, you know, a month or something now, but like I've been so tied up in assembling the thing that I'm going to show. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yep. I have 25 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is. I'm, I'm working to assemble the thing that I'm going to show so that it makes sense. So that it this, 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 right? What's the best order? What's the blah, blah, blah. And I've spent so much time inside that, that I haven't just been in my body dancing for weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> relatable um <laughs> this is my theory on so much of we're given a residency we you know the funding the thing we're gonna we gotta make the thing to show oh god and i get like way ahead of myself instead of just like you're saying like what is my body saying about this that is literally that is literally what sufei said one of the first things that sufei said to me she's like will you stop 
stop getting ahead of yourself. You know? Yeah. But I don't know. I'm sure you've experienced this, but you're right. You're absolutely right. We get the money. We got to make the thing. And I know that this, like, you know, I've listened to a few episodes of, of your stuff now. And like, it's so cool that you're taking so, like, you're making this whole idea of like healthy making so important, you know, to the work. And I'm just like, what is like healthy making though? Like, yeah, because even for me, like coming in with Real Wheels, coming in as, as co-artistic director of Real Wheels, I'm in a really interesting position. Uh, I'll say weird and sometimes uncomfortable yeah. because I'm a wheelchair user, but I'm also somebody who has been fortunate enough to have very traditional training. Right. And very traditional training doesn't make time for disability time. Right. It doesn't make time for healthy making no so you know in the leadership of the organization i have had to re-examine my own my own friggin practice right (laughs) and i'm just like i'm you know i'm in leadership of this organization and i have had to unpack my own ableism and all this other stuff and just the value of of healthy making is so good and yet i get in the studio and i'm like gotta make a thing gotta make a thing showing on the 14th of september gotta make a thing (laughs) I hear you. I say the things and then I get in the studio and then I'm like, it's got to be a good thing. I better make something good. Um, And this is just funny. With my company, TerraShine Performance, we have great pride in that we we give stipends for caregivers, you know, you know, life stuff, you know, we put aside. And then my fantastic general manager, Hannah Myers, at one point said, "Um, Tara, have, have you used any of that? stipend for child care. And I realized that I had not. I just like, I just, you know, okay, we, we got to do the thing. We kind of forget ourselves. So it's important what you're saying about like being in a leadership position where you have to unpack your own systematic garbage and do like, what is healthy for me as an artist? And creation is not capitalist, you know, rush, rush. No. And, you know, again, coming back to yesterday, I came out of yesterday's studio space going like, okay, What if I show less and go deeper? Oof. Do you know? Like, what if I show, it comes back to got to be a good thing and it's got to be, it's got to be good and it's got to be well thought out and it's got to be, you know, rendered somehow. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah. But I think about that. I was thinking about that yesterday and I was just like, what if I give people, and I was talking to the other person that's sort of, or one of the other people that's engaged as an outside eye for me is the fantastic TJ Daw. Do you know TJ? Oh, wow. Yeah. TJ was just like, because we were talking about the narrative structure of the thing. And he was just like, mm-hmm. do you know, you could just give people whatever context they need to understand the work right off the top. Mm-hmm. And then they don't have to like chew and swallow the thing you were, you know, and sort of assemble the thing that you were, because it, it's a showing. It's 20 minutes of a, a full length thing. And then, you know, he's just like, give people the context they need. Right. And then just do the thing you're going to do. So if if I give people the context that I need, they need, then I get to be in it for 20 minutes in whatever 20 minute section I'm going to show. Right. Without having to worry whether it makes sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? It feels very 101, but sometimes you need someone to say, like, look, just give people what they need to understand and do the thing you're going to do. Yeah. I mean, going back to 101 is I feel like in my mid age is kind of essential. You know, we get bogged down with all this other stuff. Um, I'm really, of course, like so into because I've seen you act. I've seen you dance. I've read your writing. um, and so I love that you're integrating all your practices. And do you feel like it's like different selves or how is that feeling for you? It doesn't feel like a different self. Mm. It feels like uh, a new version that's kind of compiled up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It feels like a better version creatively. It's not like, ah, it's not like a feeling that I've been doing it wrong for however many years, mm-hmm. but it's definitely a feeling of like, um oh this is very right for now Ooh, cool you know and talking about like middle age and having made enough stuff Mm -hmm. i'm sure you've talked about this with so many other guests but this idea that like you know at the beginning and through the the middle beginning you want to just you want to just make stuff yes you want to just get stuff out there and you'll you'll do 
whatever, or you'll sacrifice whatever, or you'll hurt yourself, or you'll whatever you'll do to to just get a shot at making something. Right. And I think in the middle here, I'm in a place, and it's again, it's a real privilege to to be here, and I'm trying to sit with how much privilege I have in the being here to sit with questions around like, okay, but why am I making what I make? And how do I challenge myself with a new process? And what's the right way to make a thing as opposed to how make a thing? <laughs> like, you know, like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it really just feels like a compiling, yeah, which is really, really nice. And, mm-hmm. And, you know, and to come at it from a place of relative stability, you know, got work, got love, got house. Yeah, right. It's so beautiful. And it's really just good to take a moment to just recognize how, like, as artists, as humans, that is nurturing ourselves and why it's so important that there is enough arts funding and people have enough work that they're not worried all the time because that stress and reading a great article an essay about hannah gatsby the comedian yeah i'm a huge massive fan but she was just talking about the bullshit of the starving suffering artist Mm. right (laughs) it's such colonial garbage um so yeah feeling like having roots so now you can bloom yeah it's easier to make and you know coming back to that bullshit of the starving artist it's an awful lot easier to make work yeah when your other stuff is as in order as it can be. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. And one of the things that I've, and I would, you know, I encourage it so much. One of the things I've been trying to write into my grants, for example, and I think we're starting to see it more as an access need. I'm Again, I've had the pleasure and the displeasure and whatever of serving on a bunch of different juries for arts things. Right. And it makes me so happy. Oh, I get so happy. <laughs> when I see people applying for funding for time yes time not time to make but time to like sit and think and rest Mm. to see somebody write in a grant and i I would love for there to be a day when it's not something we need to write in a grant it's just something that is understood but to see somebody write into a grant like look part of my creative process is rest right and i think that's becoming understood and accepted in disability art culture in a way that it's not yet in wider art culture. So it, it feels good to see that in disability art culture. But I'm, I also, mm-hmm. I would love for there to be a day when folks are, you know, folks are writing that into the grants, you know, from, from not disability art culture, just as a part of art culture. <laughs> right, exactly. Because like you say, we need time. And so often we don't have time. I think about like the kind of traditional theater, oh God. you know, contract of like 10 to 6, six days a week for like three weeks and then ludicrous tech schedules. And then everybody gets sick. And then your show finds itself halfway through its second week. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. Yeah. I mean, I do appreciate in dance and I don't know if this is like this with your kind of creative practice, but just like the logistics we tend to like work for a few weeks and then months later, a couple weeks more. And so there's like this time in between, which isn't always ideal, but I think sometimes that breath, you know, to kind of let things simmer. And they do like, I think just to reflect that rest is part of doing, is part of making, is part of being, that so much happens. I mean, we always hear this thing like, you know, leave it and go do something else, go cook or take a nap or talk to a friend and you're still, your creative self is actually still working on the thing in a different way. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is not, you know, which is not rest. Right. Which is not rest. It's not rest. It's deceiving of the mind. It's, 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 what is it called in working out? Um, It's muscle confusion. Ooh, muscle. Okay. I love when we talk about (laughs) <laughs> working out and men aren't making at the same time. So interesting. <laughs> it's muscle confusion, right? It's it's mm. it's like, I'm not thinking about that at all. I'm taking a shower. Or I'm not thinking about that at all. My thing is, I don't know if you can see it behind me. I know it's an audio format, but over the pandemic, I fell in, in love with miniature painting. Oh, cool. 
for Dungeons and Dragons. And I just fell in love with Dungeons and Dragons and I fell in love with the little little guys because painting them is not something I'm supposed to physically be able to do. Oh. So I really love like being in my hands and like painting these little dudes and like spending a bunch of time on a face. And you know what I mean? Yeah. That kind of stuff. And it's something I enjoy and it is restful, but it is also the other side of my office. Right. So, you know, I get stuck up in a piece of, of creative writing or a piece of creativity and I'll just be like, I'll paint a miniature. Yeah. And it's not rest, it's distraction. Okay. I love this. Can we dig into this more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit of a dork when it comes to stuff like this. I like to... Okay. So distraction versus rest. Is there blurring in between or is like, what's your definition? Rest for me is when I'm doing something and it's not an active not thinking of something else. It's not an active not thinking of work. It's reaching a point where I am engrossed enough in something else that absolutely isn't work that I don't think of work. Oh, so that work kind of leaves the room. Yeah, it leaves the room. It leaves the space. I'm talking about something else that I'm completely a big nerd for or you know what I mean? Yeah. Something that's not related to the work that I do for money. Yeah. To come back to the whole, like, take a break and go for a walk and blah, 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 blah. That yeah, yeah. that doesn't do it for me. Okay. Because I'm aware when I take a break and I go for a walk, yeah. I really never get past the I should be working. Okay. Like it's the I should be X. Mm -hmm. right? I should be working. I should be, I should be, I should be. I should be at least 10 pages further than I am now. <laughs> you know? like <laughs> I do. So the artificial breaks don't do it for me. What really does it for me is like enough time to stop thinking about the thing or to come back to like something my thesis supervisor said, you know, during my master's, which I did do during the pandemic because I'm that guy. You did. Oh, my God. I did. But he was just like, put a thing aside until you cannot wait to get back to it again. Oh, that's good. Right. Until you feel like you need to, until you can't resist getting back to the thing put it aside. Wow. Right. And that's a kind of time that we don't get. We don't, do we? No. No. Oh, Adam, I think this is like, <laughs> this is really important stuff because I think it's like being curious enough with yourself and your practice to clock when you're distracting yourself and you're having those should, should, shoulds versus when you're, you know, I talked to my kid about like, get bored get bored, get bored, and then let the thing come up, which as a 12-year-old, they find infuriating. But oh, everything I say is infuriating at this point. <laughs> but then I see them go into their thing and they get the Lego comes out and the drawings and the, this different self kind of emerges. That's so valuable. The time to get bored. Right? The time to get bored. The time to, yeah. I, <sighs> I'm trying to think about the last time when was the last time that I I had enough time off where I was just like, gee, I can't wait to get back to mm. this thing. I don't know if it works for you, but it doesn't do it for me. If like, it's not the same to like, I'm going to put this project aside and then go work on another thing. No. You know, that's not the same thing either. It's not the same, is it? That's not the same. No, it's more work in a different direction. <laughs> yeah, I'm just moving in a different direction. I'm fooling myself into believing that I'm taking a break from one thing by exhausting myself on another thing. Ooh, that sounds like an important thing for everyone to note. Obviously, there's like privilege to like when you can, it's like, wait a minute, am I procrastinating by working? Yeah. Or am I avoiding? Yeah, I mean, rest is something we need to fold in more. I was listening to a podcast and there was a talk about like cycles honoring your cycles of effort that sometimes we're like all in and you're just all in and it's pedal to the metal and then being aware of then there's oh, when you can have time or build some time in for those ebbs and flows to take time yeah you know i really think we need to just make it part of practice and i think we need to just mm -hmm. write in again right into our grants or however we get our funding yeah you know however we find our money you make that part of what earns you your money. Yes, because it's integral to what we do. And yet, right? <laughs> All of this stuff is, is really coming to the front for me because of my work with Real Wheels. I will say that, you know, I did Creeps with them in 2016. It was like a little yonks ago. Yeah. As part of that process, we, we did half days 
um, for twice as long. And I know because I've I've seen the grant now because I'm on the other side. But like, yeah. you know, yeah, we did half days for twice as long. And kind of like as the, you know, traditionally trained performer, actor, whatever, I was just like, I don't need that. I don't need that kind of. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't need that kind of like <laughs> that kind of accommodation because we phrase it as a as a, an access need. Right. For folks with disabilities. Right. And I'm just like, no, I don't need that. I'll just do the, <laughs> you know, I can do it. Yeah. And a 12, I can do like, you know, I can do those. I don't need it. <laughs> and, then like, <laughs> and then about halfway through the process, I was just like, oh, but it's so good, though. Oh, it's so good. It's so good for everyone. It's so good for everyone. Because, you know, the work in rehearsal like that, it isn't, I mean, I don't know, acting, it's different, but the 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 work is in what happens after rehearsal. The work, the dirty work is in memorizing the lines. It's all all that stuff, right? Right. And so to be able to like come home after half a day and just think about the things you rehearsed Ooh. and think about relationships and think about the connections that you have to the other characters or the other performers, that it was just, it felt... Mm, one of maybe, I think, less than a handful, probably fewer than five things I've done where it felt like by the time we hit audience, it was actually ready to be in front of an audience. Wow. You know, that's such a rare thing. It's so rare. Yeah, I can think of projects I've been on, especially when there's a bunch of parents. Oh. Okay, we all got to be out of there before. Like by 2, 3, we got to do pickup. We gotta, and how, I mean, it's not relaxing to go pick up your kid. However, <laughs> um, it's a lot better. I think to go pick up my kid than to have to like organize childcare and blah, 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 and work until six. And I would argue that the work that gets done between four and six on most projects when you've started at nine or 10, meh. Yeah. <laughs> I no, <don't> no. <laughs> well, I mean, even just now, my standard schedule, I have uh, Sean is away on holiday. So I'm like, Jordan and I are just like, I don't want to make the commute into the office if we're not all going to be there. So, <laughs> right. Because I'm in studio. Yeah. From nine to nine to one, Monday to Thursday, and then Friday is a full day at Real Wheels in the, in the offices of Real Wheels. But what I will normally do now is I'll I'll do like four hours in the studio, and then I'll go up in the lounge on the fifth floor of the dance center for another four hours, and do the Real Wheels time. And so that's like that actually ends up being like a oh yeah ten eleven hour plus you know with commutes in there that ends up being about a ten or eleven hour day yeah you know, not sustainable, but I got to get, you know, I got to get both in. Yeah. And again, I can say make time for rest all over the place. <laughs> but, you know, you got to get both in. Yeah, it's the reality of what we're like trying to balance, right? And that studio practice, like saying nine to one, that's like my favorite studio time. I know. God. It's delicious. <laughs> oh, and Suve actually gave me the the exercise that we did or the just the thing we did yesterday. They gave me a task and they were just like, take the first hour of your studio time from now until you're showing and just do this thing. Oh, you know, spend the time on your back, get up from on your back, listen to your text, loop your text as much as you need to loop it, see what happens in your body and then write down what happens in your body. Amazing. For the first hour. It's just like, it's just, you know, allowing that space and allowing the time. Yeah. So great. Yeah. Allowing is such a great word to, um, I find, I mean, you're already like TJ and Sufe in there. I find the importance of having like the right people and the love in the studio to allow me to give me permission. And when I'm on the outside, I feel like that's part of my job is like, how can I host this artist or this process? Yeah. Well, since we're, you know, since I've named two, I'll name the third. You know, my dear, dear friend, Naomi Brand. Oh, Naomi. Has come in. You know Naomi? Oh, yes. She's been on the show. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, we're buds. So my dear, dear, wonderful, lovely friend, Naomi Brand, is the third person in there. And she's kind of my my directorial, my choreographic outside eye in a way that Sufe is very much like sort of. The reason why I invited Sufe is because they have such a an important practice around moving in pleasure and beginning in pleasure and holding pleasure. The question that brought Sufe to me or that brought me to Sufe was, how do I tell this story that is that is really not pleasurable? Mm -hmm. How do I begin yes. uh, in pleasure and care in telling the story? And what does beginning in pleasure and care mm -hmm. do for what is essentially the trauma on a couple mm -hmm. of different fronts of you know, mine and his, uh, um, what does beginning in pleasure and joy and care do for the telling of this story? 
And so that's what brought Sufe to me. But Naomi's, you know, talking about the sort of the one person that I would want to be in pleasure in studio with. It's Naomi. Mm-hmm. And I think we've been working together for so long now. It's been 10 or 11 years. Wow. That we have that really convenient shorthand with each other. And she knows my, she knows my regular shit. Mm. And like the shit that I normally do, and she's like, oh, you know, but you've you've done this before, and you do that all the time. Like it's really weird. Yes, <laughs> I realized in the process of this piece that I don't want to, I don't want to do wheelies anymore for a time. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> it. So again, wheelchair user, but but wheelies and and like wheelie tricks and things like yeah. that. Those are I've been doing those since I was twelve, thirteen. Right. And they were fun. Yeah. It's the equivalent of, I guess, the pirouette. Like, I don't know. I don't... The virtuosic things, the, the tricks we can do, right? Yeah. It's the it's the thing. It's the stupid human trick, right? Yeah, totally. So I realized in the process of this piece that those are very much for, like, the entertainment of folks. They're, they're, they're for the entertainment of typically bodied folks, right? Mm. A wheelie doesn't interest me. Right. I've done all I can do with a wheelie. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what interests me? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Again, to bring it back to Naomi, and she's like, well, what about this? And you can expand this, and you can be inside this, and this can fit together. Like, you know, but again, she knows all the stuff I normally do. She knows the kind of mover I, I normally am. Mm-hmm. And so she has an ability to be like, okay, here's you, and here's what you normally do. <laughs> right? Now let's put that in contrast with something else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And see what that does. So she's the one that knows me well enough to stand outside and say, all right, okay, cool. I've seen that before. <laughs> totally. Yeah. People like that are gold, hey? Yeah. Like Kate Franklin and Justine are both like that. There's other people too, but those are like, especially Kate will be like, yeah, you're doing the weird head thing again. <laughs> <laughs> and Justine will go, enough with the kicks and the spins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you don't need to do those anymore, the kicks and the spin. I feel like I have to do the things to be a quote unquote dancer. dancer. I have to do like yeah. the dancer things. Yeah. But just like you say, I'm like, I'm not so interested. Connected to that is the whole idea that like I really resist moving in sort of float time, mm-hmm. like in dream time. I'm not a, I'm not a floaty mover. I'm not a beautiful mover. You know, that's not how I identify as a mover. And so part of this process, really, mm-hmm. I've tried to sort of let my body live in, in flow time Ooh. and dream time. And like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's really been interesting. But yeah, you're you're doing the weird head thing. <laughs> <It's>, it's... <laughs> I wonder what my weird head thing is. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the people who have seen us and know us and know our patterns and are such an important part of the process. And it's, yeah, it's like like you say, giving you permission also to like, what are you interested in? Yeah. 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 You know, and it really does. It really does. It's really this whole idea to like, I'm not going to do wheelies anymore um, for a while. (laughs) It really has even put me in sort of kind of a deeper discussion with myself around like who, who is, who is my audience? Mm -hmm. So to come back to, because I also have a play in development with Real Wheels, it's a couple of years out, but it's called Saturday Nights at Axles is the name of the show. Okay. It's a, you know, it takes place in a, a an East Coast Canadian, uh, I guess it's set in Newfoundland, whatever, but okay, because I'm from Newfoundland. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's a small town bar that's the only wheelchair accessible bar in the town. It's not really even a bar. It's a room in a community center. And it's about a woman who, you know, who leaves that space. Uh, because she wants more and better and, and from her life and the story is about her return. So it's it's a pretty much a prodigal story, you know, and she comes back to that space uh, having achieved a certain level of career and success. And, and she comes back looking for, you know, reconnection with the people that she left uh, and questioning why she left them. And they question why she left. And it's around questions around, you know, leaving and, and staying. Wow. All the people in the bar are people who identify with disability. Yeah. Um, so it's around, you know, how, I guess, the questions that brought me to it is are questions around how I belong mm. with that community or how I don't or why I feel that I don't or why I feel that I do and when when I do and when I don't. And as a play, it's kind of defining my, my practice now because, and I'll give credit where credit is due, I went to see Redbone Coonhound. You know that show? I haven't seen it, but I've heard about it. I went to see Redbone Coonhound. And I watched it very particularly as a as a white guy. 
Yeah. You know, my buddy Quasi, he watched it as a black person. Yeah. And it offers different conversations to to black folks and white folks. Yeah. And so I think with my position in Real Wheels, but also with my work on axles, I realized that a lot of the work that I've been making is for typically bodied audiences. And with axles, I'm just like, okay, but but what is it offering? And this was Quasi's question to me around Red Bone Coonhound is what does it offer to the conversations that I'm having with my black friends? Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What does the show offer to the conversations that I'm having in community? Right. He didn't use the phrase in community, that's me. But like that's the questions I ask around my work now is sure, you know, so what is the what is it offering to typically bodied folks? But also, how is it contributing to the conversation that we're having among ourselves? Wow. And I don't think I've gotten there before. Right. And I didn't realize I wasn't getting there before. Wow. Hey. Yeah. It's fascinating. Also, such a gift to have folks around us asking questions, like just that constant questioning. I recently had somebody say to me, uh, kind of about like, I was complaining. <laughs> Frankly, I was complaining about not getting a grant. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> you, do. you do. <laughs> and this fellow artist who's quite senior, she, she said, well, your work's for a different audience. Your work's for like, you know, the middle-aged female identifying or non-binary person who feel like it was just like, it kind of just like, oh, oh, pay attention, pay attention. And sometimes I think I was like putting all this emphasis on the dance world. Huh. So it's just great to have just the questions. And how do you think that changed your relationship, that like little piece of feedback? How did it change your relationship to your work? You know what? It made me feel really warm towards my work. It made me feel like, oh, yeah, I want to see this show. <laughs> yeah. And there's folks who want to see this show and are, are sitting there going, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm also having a hot flash. I'm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So that play, you said it's a couple of years out. You're in process on that one? Yeah, we had a reading of it. Uh, we just did at Real Wheels. We did a um, reading of three new plays. There was mine and Jordan's and a play called Phaserum by Alex Massey. And they were, you know, there are three new plays, all by playwrights who identify with disability. Um, we did a reading and it was kind of the first production that we, we called the reading series uh, Zombies, Mannequins and Talking Heads. Mm, cool. And it was a, um, a series of these three plays. and. It was the first thing we put together as the new leaders of the company. And it went over very, very, we were very uh, happy <laughs> with, with how, how well it went over. Uh, folks were really excited to see new work from the company. And it's, yeah, so yes. so Axel's is um, a couple of years out. Yeah. Um, Phase Room. Yes. We will actually be doing Alex's play Phase Room next season. Right which is pretty exciting. So come check that out. Yeah. And then actually Vascular Necrosis, which is Jordan's play. Yeah. Just got picked up as the uh, Flying Start production, the next Flying Start production with Touchstone under new leadership of Lois Anderson. Awesome. Yeah. So so all three of the plays, it's a rare thing, I think, in the city to have three plays from a reading series all go into production. Yeah, that's phenomenal and so exciting. Yeah. Is the reading series going to keep that name? Oh, I think it was just a one-off. Okay. Zombies, mannequins, and talking heads. I like the name. The zombies were were Jordan's. The mannequins were Alex. The talking heads were me. Okay. <laughs> I just, I love a good title. Oh, me too. Me too. It's a good title. <laughs> and I love it when a good title changes to a different good title. You got it. Okay. I've got like, I want to respect your time. So sure, sure, sure. I have so many questions for you, but... I'm going to hit you with a few. You can like, you can do, you know, quick response or if you want to go on, that's great. <laughs> I want to be respectful of your time too. Right now, where you are in your practice, what does it mean for you to be an artist? At this point in my career, uh, again, super privileged, glad to be here. My first response to that question is the question of usefulness. Mm. So how is the work that I'm doing useful to the conversations that people are having? What am I contributing? When the answer is nothing, I'll stop, right? Yeah. 
when somebody else tells me the answer is nothing else. To it, like, right? <laughs> but the other half of that usefulness, and maybe the more important half, you know, question around around that is how, with all the opportunity and training that I've had, how can I be useful to other people? Mm. So, uh, as part of the reason why I took a position at Real Wheels, is just like you know, there's so little training out there. We have a, we have a three year training program now, the the academy. Yeah. You know, there's so little training out there. The opportunities are still so few. The canon is still so narrow, you know. So how can I be useful to folks that want to build that canon mm -hmm. and find that experience and have those opportunities? How can, you know, there are so few people. I find the expression behind the desk fairly capitalist, right? It is. <laughs> yeah. There, there are so few people with, you know, lived disability experience in leadership positions who can mentor. Yeah. That pool of folks is so small. And I just, I want to grow that pool and I want to grow the pool of people who will eventually end up in that pool. You know, that's, that's, that's what it means for me to be making art now is, is equal parts making my own and contributing to the conversations that I know folks are having, but also just like, what are the conversations people are interested in having and how can I help them have those conversations? Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, what's the what's the worst part about being an artist these days for you? <laughs> boundaries. Mm. Boundaries. Yeah, for me, boundaries are hard. And, you know, you still get those periods where, I mean, where money is not as guaranteed. So <laughs> part of it, too, I think is like I've reached a point in my life where certain unexpected expenses emerge. You know, stuff in your house starts breaking, stuff in your body gets weird. Yeah. Stuff in, stuff in your space starts <laughs> wearing down, you know, and you're like, oh, now, like, yeah. oh, like, you know, need a new fridge. Dishwasher has exploded. Damn. There's a weird, like, spot on my kitchen floor, you know, piece of flooring that needs to be shifted out. You're just like, yeah, there's not a lot of space around, like, yeah. extra income or like, I'm starting to think about, I'm starting to think about the future in really specific ways. Oh, yeah. And the fact that I will likely be working, you know, it, it's a, a bit more of a loaded statement to say something like this uh, inside disability culture, but I feel like I may be working until I die. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Just to kind of stay ahead of. Yeah, yeah, I do. I, yeah, I very much do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the realities of sort of like future and necessity for the future yeah. are weighing heavily, which is which contributes to the question around boundaries. But yeah. Yeah. So my real answer is the notion of future yeah. and thinking of my future and preparedness for the future. Yeah. And the way that a career in the arts doesn't really let me, I don't know about a person, but it hasn't really let me prepare for the future in the way I feel like I should be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I relate to that strongly right now. <laughs> okay. What's the best part? What's the best part? I'm just going to prompt you with words like pleasure, thinking about souffle. Yeah. That's the answer that I would give. Mm. You know, the, the, the time in the studio where I just get to lie there and, you know, not feel myself in the, in the ego sort of way, but feel myself in the physical way and just reconnect to my body and feel the weight of, you know, be all dancery and say, like, feel the floor supporting me. Yeah. You know, on those days when I'm in the studio with someone I love dearly and it's just the two of us or, you know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. like the moment when I see a connection in something. The other day it was a seatbelt, right? Like I see a connection between the stories that I'm trying to tell that I didn't see before. And I think the process of devising has invited those things for me more than the process of page to stage really ever has. Wow. Yeah. The magic of the studio and things that come up and just like you said, being in there with somebody that you love and. Yeah. 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 The seatbelt thing. If your listeners want to come by in my open studio or whatever, but the seatbelt thing, it was just this really interesting moment. Uh, the seatbelt that I have is right here. And you'll appreciate this. Here it comes. Ready? Right here. This is a seatbelt. Yeah. Let me see. It's a belt. Yeah. And this is the sound. Yeah. That it makes. Ooh. Right? It's a really satisfying yeah. sound when you connect it and disconnect it. And there was something really, I was like lying there on my back in the studio and I made that sound with the seatbelt. And I was just like, oh, no, that's important. <laughs> oh, wow. That's awesome. It turns out that that's important to the telling of the story. And I was just like, oh, yeah, wow. <laughs>
And it's such a great analog sound. Yeah. I'm like geeking out on like like screen free time and like unplug like I can feel it in my body, that sound. It sounds so the word I use is oh, it's so sturdy. It's such a sturdy sound. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Love it. Okay. My penultimate question is. What is something that you're doing, and you've already talked a little bit about it, something you're doing in your life that is nurturing you as an artist? I got to go with uh, miniature painting and listening to, I listen to so much other than your fantastic podcast. Thank you. (laughs) The only, really only other podcast material I listen to, I listen to so much, so much live play Dungeons and Dragons. Y'all. Live play Dungeons and Dragons is doing it for me in in a really fantastic way. I am in love. I'll give them a shout out and maybe they'll hear it and I'll get to talk to you. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm in love with the podcast. It's called Worlds Beyond Number. Worlds Beyond Number. Worlds Beyond Number. And it's by these like four titans of tabletop RPG, the game community. And it's it's yeah. improvised and they're all improvisers and it's it's storytelling around the sort of the mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons. And the thing I was like, why is it that I can get to the end of a series of Worlds Beyond Number and start again at the top and just listen all the way down again? Wow. And the reason why is because you can hear the trust oh. that they have for each other as artists and the agency that they give each other as artists and the the, just they're all fantastic storytellers, but you can hear them being friends. You can hear their friendship. You can hear their trust. You can hear their agency. You can hear all of those things. And I'm just like, yes, storytelling like that. Storytelling like that, please. <laughs> oh, Adam, this has been like super fun. Is there anything that I didn't ask you, but you wanted to say or give a plug or I think September 14th, you're doing a showing at the Dance Center of Good Bully. Uh-huh is the working title Uh and we've got the disability tour bus we'll link that on the 24th the 24th of july this will probably come out after but it'll still be findable right oh yeah oh yeah yeah Yeah. awesome anything else i think i'm good okay this has been great it's so even just your format is great like because it's it's so rare that we get to like sit and talk normally i get like what are the sound bites yeah you know 15 minutes what are the sound bites so this is really nice Oh, thank you. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, I can't wait to see more of your dancing and talking, text, integration, all that. I can't wait. I'm excited. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Adam, for such an inspiring conversation. So many important ideas that I'm going to be thinking about. And I'd love to have you back on the show, Adam, for the next time. Also, thank you, listeners, for being here. Maybe the first time. Maybe continued listeners. Really appreciate you. Please get in touch. We're on Instagram, Tara Cheyenne TCP. Facebook, Tara Cheyenne Performance. And the old email, info at TaraCheyenne.com. Talking Shit with Tara Cheyenne is a production of Tara Cheyenne Performance. Produced, edited with original music by Mark Stewart. You can get in touch with Mark, markstewartmusic.com. And of course, as usual, one more reminder to please share this episode, to like, review, star, star, star. Donate if you can at terrashayan.com, donate button, as previously mentioned. And before I let you go, I just want to remind you to rest when you need to. It's not always easy, but just like little bits, you know, sometimes just sitting down without your phone and taking some deep breaths. That really helps me. Quotation for today from writer and Nobel Prize winner Gabriel Garcia Marquez on what matters in life. What matters in life is not what happens to you but what you remember and how you remember it. And with that, I leave you until the next time. Please keep making shit up and please take care of each other and take care of yourself. Bye-bye. This podcast is effing good.
Oh, I don't know.